you wake up to the soothing sounds of your favorite musical style, dynamically intermixed with news of local events and upbeat motivational messages culled from your online searches and interests. Your virtual agent has prepared a to-do list for your day, which hovers in mid-air across the room. As your eyes adjust to the slowly dawning ambient lighting of your home environment system, your agent reminds you of the interview you've scheduled for today, a low-demand AI training gig for which you are automatically selected based on your reputation score and previous employer reviews. Padding into the bathroom, you encounter the first advertisement of the day, a cycling animation which catches your eye from the corner of the mirror. New face avatars, put your best face forward, says the ad. Over 2,000 filters now available, complete with live setting backdrops, trademark. Gesture here to browse our catalog. You consider it for a moment, staring at your groggy reflection, but decide the monthly subscription fee would be better spent on makeup and mood enhancers. Still, you gesture with an approving signal to the ad, placing it in your playlist for future viewing. The commercial messages appearing on your walls and mirrors help offset your living expenses, and you suspect that certain ad types benefit your data wake more than others. You use the toilet and glance for a moment at your biometric readout. Your vitals are all within normal limits, nothing surprising, though it looks like you haven't been eating enough fiber. The toilet notifies your home shopping system, which prioritizes bran flakes and whole oats in the ingredients list of this week's menu, and the food printer in the kitchen adds a new canister into rotation. The smell of freshly brewed coffee wafts in from the kitchen area of your small apartment. 15-minute hot shower, you say. Your agent conveys your request to the apartment's autodomo, which dutifully adjusts the temperature as you step into the stream. As the water warms your skin, you ask for a verbal rundown of the day's events and upcoming significant dates, sliding your teeth cleaner into your mouth. Tuesday, Tuesday is Tamara's birthday, birthday, says the voice of your agent, now coming from a speaker in the ceiling. I, I can recommend nine wish list items in your gift price range. You gesture in the affirmative, mouthful of mint-flavored foam and nano-recalcifiers. The list of items cycles by, and you select a virtual visit to the Cats in Boxes stream, an in-joke you know will make her smile, and purchase another for yourself. Though you and Tamara live in different cities and neither of you has the credits for travel, your agents will coordinate on selecting a date and time, allowing you to share the experience with each other's avatars. There's enough time before the meeting to head down to the local park and join in a quick V-ball game. After requesting a city car which arrives within minutes, your agent moves with you by hopping from server to server as it continues to update you with news and video streams of interest. You cycle through a selection of visual themes, altering your view of the outside world as it rolls by. Buildings, vehicles, and people shift in appearance as you flip through your collection. Neo-noir, retro-continental, cartoon universe, ultramod fash, before you settle on the default public theme with its clean lines and simple contextual icons. At the park, you check out the progress of your community garden, a micro-farming project sponsored by your apartment complex as a perk, and place an order for drone delivery. Your share of fresh vegetables will be sent to your apartment, where the Autodoma will accept the order, washing and storing the greens. They'll make a nice side dish for a 3D printed salmon fillet. Moving toward the playing field, you pull up a menu and choose a lightweight game with a few players already in the queue, and together you spend half an hour facing off against real and virtual adversaries in an augmented arena projected upon the playing field. The logos of several major corporations line the augmented space, giving it the look and feel of a professional sports arena. Throughout the course of the game, your fit kit monitors your vital signs and communicates with your agent, which sends a report to your healthcare provider. Your activity record modulates the monthly expense of your insurance program and sends you personalized health recommendations, which help keep costs down. Scoring the winning goal, you're pleased to receive a few credits from an admiring audience member who watches the match from home via the park's public stream. As the augmented opponents fade from the field and the V-Ball arena morphs back into the green lawn of the public park, you turn and wave at the nearest cam sensor, gesturing to send a positive rep share and a quick thank you to your unknown fan. 
You chat with your teammates for a few minutes, checking out their hovering interfaces and exchanging friend requests for future games. Your agent reminds you of the upcoming interview. The atmospheric filters above the neighboring towers have diffused the bright light of the sun into a beautiful orange skyscape, maintaining the effect of a comfortably temperate morning throughout your district. You decide to walk back on foot, taking in the sights and looking up the history of a few local buildings as you go. Along the way, you peruse the data pod and flag a few salad recipes, which your agent passes to your food printer's archive for later retrieval. On your next shopping run, you'll find that several dipping sauces have been added to your suggestion list, each tagged with the recipe from which it came. The apartment's security bot recognizes you as you approach your complex, greeting you by name and opening the doors for you. You walk down corridors lined with animated advertisements for various home appliances and upscale furniture. It's been a good morning. Time to get that gig. This is Fractopia, forecasting the facts of tomorrow in the fiction of today. I'm your host, Todd Foley, and in today's episode, we'll be taking a look at ubiquitous computing at the dawn of the 22nd century. One of the most exciting features of the coming informational age is the advent of UbiComp, or ubiquitous computing. The concept is revolutionary, actually representing the convergence of several related technologies and will certainly change the way we interact with the world. But what is ubiquitous computing all about and what will it enable us to do? Part 1, part 1, what is part 1, what is part 1, what is part 1, what is part 1. According to Wikipedia, Ubiquitous computing, also described as pervasive computing, ambient intelligence, or everywhere, is a concept in software engineering and computer science where computing is made to appear anytime and everywhere. Now obviously this concept extends our common notion of processing space out into the physical environment, and so perhaps a better question to ask is, what is a Ubicomp environment? And the answer is, a Ubicomp environment is an area in which networked computing devices are pervasive, even invisibly so, allowing the user to move freely and use digital services in natural or unthinking ways. Margaret Roos, tech writer for IoT Agenda at techtarget.com, speaks about the development of ubiquitous computing, first pioneered in the Olivetti Research Laboratory in Cambridge, England, where the Active Badge, a clip-on computer the size of an employee ID card, was created, enabling the company to track the location of people in a building, as well as the objects to which they were attached. This concept was quickly expanded into a broad set of parameters and maxims in Mark Weiser's seminal paper, The Computer for the 21st Century, published in Scientific American in 1991. Link in the notes below. Weiser and his colleagues at Xerox PARC worked up the notion and created a building-wide system comprised of tabs, pads, and boards, otherwise known as inch, foot, and yard. Tabs were small devices that could be held and operated with one hand, from the size of a PDA down to the size of a post-it note. Pads were medium-sized devices, often operated with a stylus, similar in size and form factor to today's touchscreen tablets and field instruments. Finally, boards featured large display screens, not unlike today's digital whiteboards, but smarter and connected to the rest of the system via homogeneous network. These devices of varying sizes not only tracked the movements of people throughout the Ubicomp environment, but could also send data and programs across the network to each other, allowing workflow to migrate along with you as you move from area to area within the environment, leading to seamless and transparent ongoing interaction regardless of your location in the building.
Weiser sometimes referred to his goal as calm computing. Here explained by Jeffrey Challen, assistant professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Buffalo. The goals of calm computing are that as computing becomes more pervasive, it vanishes into the environment around us. It is no longer something that interrupts us. It's no longer something that we have to interact with on its terms. It becomes a part of the environment around us. So you can imagine a world where we have the benefits of computing, access to information, the ability to communicate with each other, uh, all the different types of services and tools that we use computers for now, but we live in a world that feels like it's pre-computing. We don't interact with a computer directly using a keyboard or a mouse. We don't have to look at a screen. We don't have to find out that we got an email because something buzzes in our pocket in the middle of an important conversation. So a world where we have all the benefits of today's mobile and pervasive technologies and all the benefits of the internet, and yet where the world feels like computers have vanished. In the words of Mark Weiser, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. Part two. Part two. When we are now. When we are now. When we are now. When we are. Today, nearly everyone is familiar with the phrase "the Internet of Things." It's become a buzzword and may soon fall out of fashion, but the ideas it brings forward are important and will form the basis of tomorrow's Ubicomp environments. According to Wikipedia, the Internet of Things, or IoT, is the network of physical devices, vehicles, home appliances, and other items embedded with electronics, software, sensors, actuators, and wireless connectivity, which enables these things to connect and exchange data. This dynamic approach to connectivity and processing power has today been made possible by another buzzword you might have heard a relatively new form of extensible distributed computing known as technologies of the cloud. Here's computer scientist Gregory Abowd explaining the benefits. The ability to take distributed computing capabilities, both in terms of storage and in terms of compute cycles, and commoditize that in such a way that it is very easy for us to access computing cycles or storage uh, almost uh, um, free and almost an infinite amount of those uh, um, with commodity services today. You know, the notion of distributed computing is fairly old. Uh, you can go back to the late 70s and, and uh, see articles that talk about being able to get machines to control each other through the passage of, of uh, data packets or messages to control each other's behavior. So it's not new to think about distributed computing, but what's new about cloud technologies, specifically things like the Amazon services, Dropbox and, uh, and uh, uh, OneDrive and, and things like that, is that we now have, have commoditized this to the point where we almost literally do not have to worry about the device that is the conduit for accessing the data or being able to access the computational services. Those sit somewhere else and we can access them from a variety of devices relatively easily. These pervasive computing devices are network connected and constantly available. Increasing in number and processing capability, computers are being installed in all manner of goods and products even wearable products. We have seen an emergence of devices that normal people would tolerate on their bodies. Uh, you know, health tracker devices that look like uh, um, uh, nice little uh, bracelets. Um, this next one I'll talk to you about, the head-mounted ones, they haven't quite broken through yet, but they're, they're getting there and becoming commercially uh, viable. Uh, uh, a variety of, of capabilities that sit on our body. And the prediction that I would make, it's actually not too much of a prediction anymore, is that what we now have is a single all-purpose device, the smartphone that sits in our pocket, is now competing with a wide variety of disaggregated capabilities across our body. And the challenge we have is to provide an aggregated experience with devices that make more sense not being in our pocket but being elsewhere on our body. A relatively recent advancement in IoT technology is SYNC a system that allows you to connect your Bluetooth-enabled phone with your vehicle. Here's Bill Buxton at TechFest 2013 talking about Sync and the relationship it enables between your phone handset and your car. 
The point is this, think about it for a moment. Technologically speaking, when you're in the car driving, if you've got sync in your car or whatever you use in your car, the only things being used in the handset are the SIM chip, the Bluetooth chip, the battery, and a little bit of logic. The speech recognition, the microphone, the speaker, the address book are in the car. And by bringing these two things together, you have this synergistic thing that happens and they, they're unified. When you're in the car, not only does the underlying hardware change, 90% of it changes, but the entire interaction language changes from touch and eyes, which are the dominant human, from the human perspective, the channels you use in working with modern, to speech in and speech out, period. Eyes free and hands free, as it should be. So we've had a 100% change in interaction language and a 90% change in the hardware while I'm driving. So now watch what happens. I park the car. I'm still talking to my son on the car. I pick up the phone, the handset, as the car's shut down, I walk away and I keep talking. And nobody notices the miracle, the miracle that happened. In the course of that conversation and that transaction, 100% of the UI changed because it's now back to Metro or, or modern, and 100% of the phone is in my hands. And you didn't notice it, why? Because it's not about the phone. It's not about the technology, it's about the conversation. Now, technologically, this requires a number of things. Uh, tags, sensors, devices, caches, gateways, networks, aggregators, and of course, the cloud. Now, some of these things are optional. Uh, note one, the vital ones are sensors, gateways, networks, and cloud. Note two, elements may be combined. So your phone, for instance, is both a device and a sensor. And finally, sensors may sense other sensors, or tags, or real people and things in the world. In the future, operations at all levels, especially the top and bottom of the chain, will be assisted by specialized AIs, expert systems, and machine learning systems. Part three. Part three. How it works. How it works. How it works. Like any other form of computing, IoT applications possess three phases or modes: input, processing, and output. What's unique about the IoT is its flexibility and interoperability, as these phases or modes are spread across different devices, together making a dynamic web of services continually and instantly available regardless of location. Input systems include all types of sensors and human interface devices. They may be activated by gestures, verbal commands, specific actions, or the mere proximity of an individual or object. Processing may be performed by a particular device or handed off to a virtual server located in the cloud dedicated to handling input from that sensor or device, or it may be a mixture of the two. Output may be displayed on the same device or on another or used to trigger the activation of some remote virtual or physical machine elsewhere in the environment. Some examples might make this more clear. An energy reporting system consists of energy use sensors sending input to an energy use processor which outputs a report on energy used per device per hour. This same data would be sent to both the power company and the owner or tenant. A route picking system consists of traffic sensors which send input to a traffic flow processor and outputs a display in the form of a map showing suggested alternate routes to your destination. Data from these same sensors can also feed the traffic control and taxi navigation systems. A lighting control system consists of pedestrian sensors sending input to a proximity lighting processor which sends its output to an actuator turning the lights on and off as you enter and exit areas of the building or sections of the street. During off hours, the same sensors could feed the security system, perhaps activating an employee RFID scanner. Similar connections may be made between your home systems, work systems, entertainment systems, personal devices, and professional service providers using any combination of visual, auditory, or text-based mediums wherever you go. This is the conjunction of the Internet of Things, 
wearable computing, mobile apps, geolocation, and augmented reality. Five types of IoT communication. One, telemetry, geospatial information from device to network. Two, queries, requests from device to network, responses from network to device. Three, commands, two-way function commands between network and devices. Four, notifications, information in the form of messages sent from network to device. Five, system commands, depending on security level access, two-way traffic between network and devices, implementing administrative control. In an IoT environment, the key aspect is that such connections may theoretically be made between any two devices or systems at any time. Your refrigerator, oven, pantry, television, game interface, toothbrush, Fitbit, shower, and even your toilet will communicate with your PDA, your home control system, your bank, your healthcare provider, your utility providers, and a variety of vendors and advertisers, all sending each other data pertinent to the effortless maintenance of your work, play, free time, resources, expenses, health, and personal calendar. That's a lot of devices. In the words of Margaret Roos, the vision of pervasive computing is computing power widely dispersed throughout daily life in everyday objects. The Internet of Things is on its way to providing this vision and turning common objects into connected devices. Yet, as of now, it requires a great deal of configuration and human interaction, something Wiser's ubiquitous computing does not. Part four, part four, levels, part four, and silos, and silos, and silos, and silos. All services in the IoT take place on one of three levels on the device itself, in the cloud, or on multi purpose nodes which sit between these two layers on a level known as the fog. As you rise from level to level, from the edge to the fog to the cloud, security becomes tighter and processing capability is greater. First is the local level, or the edge, comprised of devices which perform their own functions internally or use local area networks to communicate directly with other nearby devices. This level is used by self-contained real-time functions, such as vehicle operations, home appliances, and surveillance devices, as well as non-vital local-only systems like games and other self-contained programs. Next up the chain is the fog, comprised of physical gateway systems which are distributed redundantly throughout the environment. These gateway systems are both processors and storage devices, as well as aggregators and routers. They determine which data needs to be pushed up to the cloud and which can be processed more locally. Since many processes can be handled closer to the edge of the network, physically closer to the user, fog systems reduce latency and greatly reduce the load on the cloud. Wide area networks, work hubs, social media platforms, multiplayer games and publicly accessible data utilities are hosted on this level, as well as entertainment and public services. For reasons of personal privacy, gateway level public data is often scrubbed or aggregated, pooled from streams coming in from multiple users, devices, and systems. Here's Deepak Darok explaining why the fog is a necessary part of the IoT's network environment. What do you call a cloud that is closer to the ground? It is fog. Fog computing is a, is a paradigm that extends cloud computing and services to the edge of the network. Similar to cloud, fog provides data, storage, compute, and application services to the end users. The distinguishing fog characteristics are its proximity to the end users. Fog infrastructure redistributes the data and compute so that much of the action takes place on the edge devices, right at your fingertips. 
the application services are hosted on the network edges, uh, routers, switches, etc. The goal of the fog computing is to improve the efficiency and reduce the amount of data that needs to be transported to the cloud for analysis, for processing, for storage. Finally, we come to the cloud level, where big data and network-intensive processes are stored and performed. This level handles such services as the metering and distribution of water and power, road control systems, connected cars, drone fleets, AI databases, and public-facing corporate services like online tools, virtual worlds, and security systems. User commands, sensors, devices, and RFID tags feed input via the network to the FOG gateways, which either handle them directly or route them as necessary to virtual servers in the cloud. As you move throughout the city, signals from your various devices and ships are passed off from one sensor to another, from one device to another, and from one gateway to another. Some of the systems you contact are physical machines, while others are virtual and spawned as needed. Some companies will provide their own dedicated gateways for their devices, while others will rely on the open fog, thus reducing the cost of development and maintenance. The integrity and security of your data depends on the efficient siloing of information among different systems, each granting a different level of access to you, your intelligent assistants, your employers and employees, vendors and suppliers, business associates, personal connections, and registered devices. Your employers hold all information related to your work for them, while your healthcare provider stores your medical data. Various games and social networks store data related to your online profiles, activities, frequented locations, point scores, and social networking connections. Assorted vendors and advertising companies each store their own data on your purchases and preferences, and the city court stores data on your criminal record and any prior cases in which you were involved. Anyone skilled and well enough equipped to break into all of these systems could put together a thoroughly detailed dossier on you, which of course is why the information is siloed into vertical partitions and related to different aspects of your life and online activities. Perhaps needless to say, the organizations and individuals storing your data operate under strict regulations limiting the amount of information they may share with each other. Part five. Part five. Where it's going. Where it's going. Where it's going. Where it's going. In the ubiquitous computing environment of tomorrow, digital skins and textiles processing capable materials, wireless communication and networking technologies will connect all of your devices and systems with other systems, networks, RFID tags, and software agents. By communicating with each other as you move through the world, these devices and systems will pass tasks, data, and identifying codes from one to another, allowing your entire soft space to move with you. Once again, here's Bill Buxton. What we saw with that car example on the phone is what I would say at the technological level is an example of seamless aggregation when I bring the phone together with the car into a new entity with new properties and disaggregation as I move apart. And that aggregation and disaggregation take place seamlessly. In order that inconsistency of technology gives me consistency of experience in terms of quality of what I'm doing, in terms of my intention. But at the functionality level, the service for me, there's something else going on there, which would be what I call, would characterize as graceful augmentation and degradation of capability. Why single out the car? Why not have my Canon EOS 5D hook up my phone? If I've got, spent the money, because that's not a camera, by the way, that's a highly, a uh, capable computer that happens to have light in and pixels out. And it's got more signal processing than the space shuttle had. So when I have it beside my phone, why can't it pair as seamlessly to my phone 
as could my car. So that when I take a picture with my SLR, when I can control depth of field and all these things, it goes immediately there and I can send it off to Instagram. Why wouldn't that be possible? Taking this concept several steps further, Gregory Abowd sees a future world covered in programmable textiles and what he calls computational skin. We are starting to see the vision of what it might mean for everyday objects to have computational capabilities in the object as they are made. What's going to happen soon is we are going to be able to do mass fabrication of materials, and those materials will be computers, self-sufficient computers, ones that not only can perform computation and communication, but can harvest the energy to do those things. The canonical technology is what I will call computational skin, and what you're going to do with it is what we all need to be brainstorming about. So what is computational skin? Well, there are going to be advances in materials engineering and manufacturing processes that are going to uh, uh, allow us to get to the point where any surface of any physical object will be computationally empowered, enabled. It will be able to store information. It will be able to compute logical operations. It will be able to communicate within the surface and between surfaces. And it will sense and perform actuation. And, and this is the, the trickiest but the most important part, it's going to be able to harvest the power in order to do all of those above. So now we're thinking about a world where any surface, physical surface, can be computational, like a post-it note. If you look at Weiser's visions of ubiquitous computing, he talked about disposable computing artifacts like post-it notes. So he actually did, this actually is just a realization in some sense of what he thought ubiquitous computing might really mean. We can rethink how we might collaborate with people because a whiteboard with post-it notes on it can know who placed the post-it note there, when they were placed there, what content was on the note, and how they might relate to each other. Here's an example of something third generation ubiquitous computing has been trying to do but has not succeeded. Indoor localization. So you look at this particular scene in a shopping mall and you see lots of objects all throughout. But the object that I'm most interested in these series of pictures is the little girl, right? I have children, one of whom is a runner. Even though now he's 15 years old, we have challenges with this particular child running off and not knowing where he is. Well, if his shoes have computational skin on them and the tile in the mall have computational skin, we have a trace of where that child went. We've been trying indoor localization for, a, for, you know, for asset tracking. This is the asset that I'm particularly interested in being able to track. And there's a different way we might be able to explore that in a world of computational skin. Look at food safety, being able to uh, um, package things with uh, technology that knows when they were packaged, how much is in them. So how might we rethink if the actual packaging itself has the an ability to understand what's inside it and to be able to communicate that to any surface upon which it is placed? How might we rethink voting? Uh, we had a Nobel laureate come to Georgia Tech last semester and he talked about how electronic voting will never work and it's because ultimately you need to have a reliable audit trail and in the electronic world we cannot provide that. Even though there are lots of advantages of electronic acquisition and tallying of votes, that paper ballot is something we really want. To which my response is why do we think we can't have paper ballot and electronic voting all at, at the same time. Think about computational skin throughout your entire home environment. All of these advances in digital services and materials manufacturing will lead to a tremendous and diverse ecosystem of interactive devices and services, all network connected and interoperable. Biosensors that report your physical state to healthcare servers, informative messaging systems, and public services. Receptive displays enabling you to send graphics, text, and other data back and forth between your device and the display board. Public kiosk screens with all manner of civic services such as ride calling and route planning. Universal translation as a standard feature of PDAs and public service devices such as information kiosks. Interactive ads that know you or recognize something you're carrying 
or respond to a physical action you perform. Digital responses and services will be triggered by proximity body sensing, by device-to-device -device dragging and dropping, and by all manner of physical interactions with the environment. As Bill Buxton explains, Bus shelter, big Nike ad on it. So I walk up to the Nike ad, and I pull out my phone, and I point it at the ad, and I click a button, and it sends across, and up pops a route map that gives me all the information relevant, centered on that particular little corner where I did it at that bus shelter so I can get that stuff. I can use the touch screen on my phone to control the interface on the screen or my voice, just as I would with a touch pad on my laptop to the screen on my laptop, because quite frankly, why would I use the dinky little screen here when Nike's gonna offer me this great big honkin' display that get, lets me see the map in its entirety? It's way better. And then I can just pull it, back in here the information I wanted, and to leave, leaving nothing behind there that, I, that was private, and having nothing, um, let's say, malicious on my phone in complete security. Every place you see a poster or a sign, paper or otherwise, it is going to be an interactive display in the next few years. Now, all of this hardware, of course, requires a lot of software. Due to advances in cloud technology and cheap computing power, we will have effectively infinite memory and storage available. But where will all this software live? Not in the devices, for the most part. Most of it will live in the future descendant of today's cloud-based virtual servers, in the global utility fog. Remember our earlier definition of fog computing? Now take that concept and wrap it around the world. Extending the modern concept of the cloud globally and assuming the creation of homogeneous communications protocols, the global utility fog aims to cover the entire planet in a shroud of data processing systems. This nebulous fog surrounding the planet will be an effectively limitless public pool of virtual machines in which computing resources are provisioned as needed allowing users from anywhere on Earth to gain access to the systems and data they require at the moment they require it, regardless of physical location. Within the global fog will reside all manner of public apps, systems, archives, and data. Thanks to this arrangement, your processing and storage capability will not be limited to your hardware. For the most part, your personal devices will simply send requests, commands, and data, and receive just enough data or content to display it as you need it. The heavy lifting will be done by virtual machines in the fog, and the data goes where it's needed. Once again, Bill Buxton. In the future, the quality of experience will be determined by how products work together in concert with the rest of the ecosystem, not just by the quality of experience of any product on its own, no matter how good that experience is. Physically, the fog is supported by a global myriad of towers, hubs, relayers, routers, and satellites, uniting the world into a single homogeneous open network. Within the Ubicomp zones of the world, a constantly available array of systems are designed to support the seamless transport of massive data as they roam about the network. Move from your office to your car and your entire workload, along with all your apps and the conversation you're in the middle of, comes with you. As you move around, your system and all of your apps leap from host to host, claiming slices of the fog for their own processing and moving on to the next host as needed. Ubiquitous computing will occur in any device, mounted, worn, or carried, at any time, in any place, and in various data formats, across any network, and will even allow these devices to hand off tasks to each other, seamlessly and transparently. Supported by the global utility fog, we will finally be free, not only from restrictions of physical location, but from the limitations of any particular device and our work and play will follow along with us effortlessly as we move around 
in a world of invisible computers. Thank you for listening to this episode of Fractopia. I'm your host, Todd Foley, reminding you to comment, like, subscribe, and share as feeding those important algorithms will help bring the show to a broader audience of futurists and fictioneers. If you're feeling especially warm and fuzzy, please feel free to show your support by dropping a one-time donation at thisisfractopia.com or joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash fractopia. Sources and links for further reading can be found in the show notes below. <laughs>